From South Carolina Public Radio, this is Walter Edgar's Journal. I'm Walter Edgar, and I'd like to welcome you to our podcast series about South Carolina culture and history with a nod to all things Southern. I'll be joined today by my producer and co-host, Alfred Turner. And today we're going to be talking about an innovative strategy undertaken by the town of Sumter, South Carolina in the early 1920s to try to survive the economic devastation that came about when the boll weevil came into the state and devastated our biggest cash crop, cotton. And that innovation involved the entire community of Sumter. To help us tell the story of Sumter's success and the industry it brought to the state is Dr. Jessica Elfenbein, who is chair of the History Department at the University of South Carolina. Today, my guest is Dr. Jessica Elfenbein, who is primarily an urban historian, but today we're gonna talk about the woods and the forests and conservation in South Carolina. So Jessica, delighted to have you with us. Thank you. And how did you stray from urban America into the forests? Well, I came to South Carolina about 12 years ago And having just completed a big urban history project in Baltimore um, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, I came to South Carolina. I worked actually in the graduate school for the first five years or so that I was here at USC. And then I returned to the history department and taught for a couple of years. And then colleagues reached out after the National Park Service reached out to them Each national park has something called a historic resource survey, which looks at the human history of the park and its environs. And the National Park Service in 2017 wanted to begin one for Congaree National Park. Colleagues reached out to me, not because I knew very much about environmental history, but rather because I had a lot of project management experience. And I've always had a bloom where you're planted sort of approach to historical research. And I thought there was so much interesting work that had been done here, but also still to do. So I agreed to become the principal investigator on that National Park Service study. And each of the team involved in that work took a chapter. And I took the extractive industries chapter to write about the history of the lumber companies who came to South Carolina uh, after Reconstruction because of a perfect storm, the storm being the clear cutting of the upper Midwest and of New England and the devaluation of land in the American South. They came down and the, the, the group that I was looking at, the group that owned Congaree before it was Congaree, was the Santee River Cypress Lumber Company, which was owned by Chicagoans. It was a group of investors, but they were led by Francis Beidler, and by Benjamin Franklin Ferguson, and I became totally enthralled with their stories. And I was also really taken and really concerned, actually, that the narrative of our our state includes so little about uh, the history of lumber, which, in fact, is the largest industry in the state. And and you mentioned Mr. Beidler, who, Mm -hmm. of course, made it possible, the land that he conserved to become the last first growth forest that we've got on the eastern seaboard just about. Yes, and two, in fact, because the Francis Beidler Forest, which is a South Carolina Audubon Society site, was also land that had been acquired by the Santee River Cypress Lumber Company, as was Congaree National Park. So both of those parks today, which are coming up to their 50th anniversaries, were conserved in part because Beidler had the financial wherewithal not to need to sell the land immediately when the um, Santee River Cypress Lumber Company closed. The company itself closed by 1916, 1917. I learned that story. It operated a very successful lumber mill um, and lumber town in Ferguson, which was on the, the banks of the Santee River from about 1890 to about 1916 or so. And then I knew the Santee Cooper story and the drowning of the town of Ferguson by 1940-41. But I wanted, after I finished the um, National Park Service work, I was very interested in trying to fill in the story about what had happened to the land between, say, 1916 and 1940. And that was a very interesting um, chapter as well. I got to ask a question now, because newcomers to South Carolina may wonder why the town was drowned. (laughs) Yes, it's it's a very good question. And I know we have another expert here in Walter Edgar, but the bottom line from where I sit is that uh, as a New Deal project, 
some white South Carolinians who were in leadership positions were interested in putting people back to work and also in hydroelectric power and were able to get support from the federal government to create the Santee Cooper Authority, which be- was at the time the um, largest land clearance project in American history. And the photographs of the trees in that forest. There's one that has about eight men holding hands around this gigantic cypress tree. Yes, and it was also, the so the land clearance was on about 180,000 acres of land, and that land clearance project brought hydroelectric power to South Carolina. It, it created both Lakes Marion and Lake Moultrie, but it also displaced 901 families, the vast majority of whom were African American. And that story really hadn't um, been much told, but I'm delighted that there are some incredibly able graduate students now doing work on those topics. Okay. Well, let's get back into sure. the lumbering industry. Mm-hmm. We mentioned Cypress, but also in, in furniture making, you'd have had sweet gum, you mm-hmm. would have had poplar, you would have had water oak, maple. And in 1929, the Williams Furniture Company was opened in Sumter, South Carolina. You sent me a teaser a while back that this was a forerunner of community involvement in terms of economic development. So let's go down that rabbit hole. Sure. So um, when I mentioned earlier that I was interested in what had happened to Bidler land between 1916 and the closing of the, the plant at Ferguson and the drowning of the town of Ferguson for Santee Cooper in 1940, what I discovered is, let me take one step back. Altogether, the Santee River Cypress Lumber Company controlled as much as 200,000 acres of South Carolina old growth hardwood forest. And of that, they owned about 135 or 140,000 acres, and the rest they owned timber rights to. And after the, the factory closed, by 1920, another company came in. Brooklyn Cooperage came in. Brooklyn Cooperage was a wholly owned subsidiary of the American Sugar Refining Company. So that's Domino Sugar. Mm-hmm. And they came to South Carolina looking for sweet gum, red gum, because red gum, which had been considered a trash tree, was actually really good for barrels, for staves and for headings for barrels. And they set up a mill first in Georgetown, but almost immediately after they got to South Carolina, they wanted a second location. And so they began scouting for locations, and Sumter, in the meantime, had a very sophisticated and very ambitious board of trade that got set up once the boll weevil had come in and decimated their cotton crop on which their economy was dependent. And the board of trade in Sumter began actively recruiting the Cooperage, uh, Brooklyn Cooperage, to come to Sumter to set up shop there. And the Sumter Board of Trade had brought in national consultants to work with them to figure out what kind of industry could replace cotton. And the national consultants, there were two groups of them, uh, came together on a plan in 1923-24 and suggested that wood products was the way to go and furniture was probably really important. There wasn't much experience in Sumter County with furniture prior to this. Um, So two things were happening at the same time. The Board of Trade wanted to create a demonstration factory to show other Sumterites that they could create successful furniture plants. And at the same time, the Board of Trade was recruiting Brooklyn Cooperage to set up a Cooperage in Sumter, which became the biggest plant. But the Williams furniture story is pretty interesting because uh, Oliver L. Williams came to Sumter in 1921 or so to set up a veneer plant. And He was doing a good job with his veneer plant as the Board of Trade was trying to set up a demonstration furniture company. (laughs) And um, they raised from the community, they raised somewhere in 1923 dollars, around $100,000 to to build the first furniture company there, which in time became, it was called Williams Furniture, but it wasn't owned solely by O.L. Williams, unlike the veneer plant, which was. It was owned by stockholders throughout the community, over 100 stockholders. And, and that that is what I, I think is the important part is, in some ways, this is new, but in, in others, it's not. The, some of the early textile towns in South Carolina were created by local entrepreneurs, the community mm-hmm. coming together and investing in in the mill. In this case, they're not investing in a textile mill. Mm-hmm. They're investing in uh, a furniture plant, something that's, as you said, 
totally different from anything else going on in South Carolina. Now, there's a big furniture industry in North Carolina right. up at high, up at High Point, right. and interestingly, Mrs. Williams was from High Point. That is uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, and of course, when you look at furniture making in early 20th century America. You go to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and there's a connection there, too. Right. The connection with Grand Rapids is very interesting. The first furniture designer for Williams Furniture was a woman named Marie Kirkpatrick, who was herself a second-generation furniture designer, and she was out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, and Williams Furniture, once it was up and going, was sending more than 20 car loads, railroad car ro loads of furniture up to Grand Rapids annually, which was the center of the American furniture industry at the time. And the economic development people who came up with the plan to create the furniture plant in Sumter were certain that Sumter had real um, advantages, in fact, over High Point, because there was much more local hardwood here and because the nexus of railroad lines here was much better, so they felt that they could undercut prices in um, High Point. So that was, that was on the table. I just want to circle back to one thing that you asked about with the economic development. You know, when when we hear now stories about Scout Motors coming to Richland County um, and all the economic inducements that have been offered to them, it is reminiscent of 100 years ago because Williams Furniture, as we've just talked about, raised $100,000 to welcome a furniture company to town as a demonstration project. But in addition to that, when Brooklyn Cooperage did relocate to Sumter, which happened, they announced they would do that in about 1927. That was to a large degree because of the economic inducements offered by the community to Brooklyn Cooperage. So they were given the title to 70 acres along the siding for the railroad tracks along Turkey Creek and Sumter. Um, free and clear. It was given to them. And then lots of other companies in town put up something to help them relocate. They were a multinational corporation in 1923 who relocated to Sumter. They became the largest employer. They were a much larger employer for their two decades or so than Williams Furniture was at the same time. But both were very, very important to the development of the wood products industry in Sumter. Okay. It's safe to say then that the, the efforts in Sumter were, were singular and that for the rest of the state, when the bull weevil hit, it was a large hit. Well, it hit Sumter hard, too, but this was in reaction to it. Yeah. yeah. It led to the Great Migration. Yes, it did, for whites and blacks. African Americans headed mm. primarily north using the railroads. White South Carolinians headed all the way west. And by the time you get to 1940, 25% of the people who were listed South Carolina as their birthplace lived somewhere else. Well, this is a, a personal relationship to me because my wife's family, there are people from her family on the West Coast because in this time period, they had to go West. Yep. What what they, they frequently did, they just literally walked out mm -hmm. because the, the majority of the state uh, workforce, white and black, was in, in agriculture. Right. And it was not just the bull weevil. There was also a four, a four or five year drought. Of course, the price dropped out of the cotton market as well. So people just, their cases after case, they just literally walked out the door and left. Yeah, sort of a perfect storm for leaving. And the question was, what kind of ant antidote could civic leadership come up with if they could come up with anything? Yeah. And in Sumter, they came up with this, which yeah. is amazing. It yeah. is amazing. Now, what is interesting about the Williams Furniture Plant, because when Jessica first contacted me, I began digging in. It was a fascinating story. They were hiring 400 people, putting 400 people to work. And in the parlance of the day, there was an article in the Sumter Daily Item that said, great skill was not required for those who worked in the factory. Now, you've got wages, but it was estimated in the dollars of the day that Williams Furniture Company was putting about thirty to forty thousand dollars a month into the Sumter economy. That's wages, supplies, and what have you. And the supplies we're talking about are the lumber, different kinds of lumber that Jessica mentioned. The woods used in Williams Furniture uh, that was manufactured here, it was all harvested within about a hundred miles of Sumter, mm -hmm. and they included such things as sweet gum and water oak maple. Um, they 
if the furniture required uh, mahogany, that was a veneer, that was imported. They didn't make the furniture out of solid walnut. They turned that into veneer, but the walnut was also available locally. In an article about the company, they described the names of the bedroom suits, and this company <laughs> only made bedroom furniture. And this is very 19, late 1920, early 1930s. Cape Cod maple or Pennsylvania Dutch maple, Chinese Chippendale, modern classic, Art Modern. Those were the, the names given to the bedroom suits that this company made, but they were not marketed, Jessica, by Williams. They were sold to right. Sears Roebuck. Yeah. Or, they were wholesaled, and that changed in time, but in the beginning, that's, that's the way it went, and eventually they got a contract for all of Holiday Inn furniture. So they were a, running kind of a, a working class to lower middle class kind of furniture suite suit operation. Um, they were not the only, Williams was not the only furniture manufacturer in Sumter during the, the 20s, 30s, 40s. Corn Industries was also there. So Chester Corn had come to Sumter early by about 1920, 21, and he was an experienced lumberman who'd come on a cutting trip and he decided to stay and set up shop. And he also specialized in bedroom suits, <laughs> but he was, uh, his, his were at a higher price point and they were solid wood. So kind of, kind of interesting there as well. Especially today when furniture in American stores is made overseas of sometimes questionable quality and a lot of times of pressed wood, which is heavier than solid wood. A couple of things um, that I think might be interesting to, to sort of um, introduce here. When the this very ambitious Board of Trade was doing its work in the early 1920s in Sumter in response to the devastation of the boll weevil, one of the things that they were working very hard to do was to prevent further out-migration of white workers from Sumter. And while these workplaces did employ people of color Later, originally, the, the, the goal was all about keeping white people in Sumter County. Well, and in this time, uh, in the textile mills, the employees were all white except for some service jobs. But actually, whether it was in the weave room or the spinning room, all of that was done by white mm -hmm. labor. Frequently, women. He, here it was men. And then the Board of Trade was interested in promoting other occupational opportunities for women and some hosiery companies and other jobs opened for women. But um, the furniture companies, with the exception of office work, um, were pretty heavily gendered towards men, So, which makes Marie Kirkpatrick as the earliest of their furniture designers even more interesting, I think. And they were, Alfred, to piggyback on something you asked about earlier, one of the, the early supporters of the Board of Trade's initiative to come up with the money for the incentive to the company was Charles T. Mason, who had Sumter Telephone Company, which had begun in 1899. And the idea, his idea was not to infringe on Alexander Graham Bell's patents. And he had his own telephone technology. But of course, telephones were in wooden um, boxes at that point. And Charles Mason had been north twice. He was a native Sumterite, but he had been north twice. He had worked with northern uh, workers, and he decided it was much better to have unskilled Southerners who he could train than to worry about whether or not people were skilled. And a lot of the jobs in the furniture factories were not heavily craftsman jobs. They were heavily mechanized jobs. And uh, so it's just sort of interesting. Well, your work attracted a lot of other interests, and you recently had a symposium in, in Sumter, and you want to talk about that? Because you brought people from across the country to talk about different subjects. Mm -hmm. Yes. In April, um, in the third weekend of April, we had a, a convening in Sumter called Wood Basket of the World, Lumbering, Manufacturing, and Conserving South Carolina's Forests. And it was a weekend-long event with two days of field trips and a day of um, sort of symposium-style presentations. And we had eight scholars there representing institutions from across the country. Um, we had a geographer from Berkeley. We had an anthropologist, archaeologist from the University of Texas um, at Austin. We had somebody from UNC Wilmington, somebody from Clemson, several of us from the University of South Carolina here at Columbia, 
And people presented these incredibly interesting work on topics related to lumbering manufacturing and conserving the forest here. And some in really unexpected ways, um, and it was great. And we were very lucky because we've attracted sponsorships from a whole range of community partners and university partners as well, because not so much, I think, because lumber is sexy. I'm not sure lumber is sexy, but more because once we raised the issue of the fact that it's not part of our narrative, people were like, you're right, it's everywhere, and yet it's not part of the narrative. Two-thirds of our state is covered in commercial timberland. Mm -hmm. The industry employs currently in 2023 employs 90,000 people. It's a huge industry. And yet we we it's almost as if it's hidden in plain. The history of the industry is hidden in plain sight. And so I think that's why there's been so much traction. And we have some next steps. We're going to do a traveling exhibit. I don't know what it'll be called, but right now we're calling it Made in South Carolina, where we will um, create an exhibit of wood products that were manufactured here. So this will certainly include barrels and furniture suits. <laughs> and uh, coffins were another big industry out of Sumter. Um, but there were other things as well. So we'll we'll collect some examples of those products and the, the exhibit will travel. And then we're getting ready um, in partnership with Thomas Cooper Library and the University of South Carolina Press to do uh, a publication which will feature the the papers that were given at the convening and other work as well in an open access digital humanities project that will be available free and online. Um, and that helps the press as they sort of take on a new direction in their own work. And it gives us a, a really interesting way to share scholarly work with a broad public audience. And the university now owns the papers from the Williams Furniture Company. No, the university does not own the papers of the Williams Furniture Company. They are owned by Sumter County Museum, which is housed in the Williams Bryce home in Sumter. But a really nice partnership has developed. The Sumter County Museum is lending the Williams Furniture Company papers to us here at the University of South Carolina. We're moving them to Columbia shortly, where they will be fully processed and digitized. And then we will return them to the Sumter County Museum. But again, there'll be public access in ways that there never have been. And this is important also, not only for the reasons we've talked about so far, but also because Williams Furniture was a union shop. Mm -hmm. It was unionized by the mid-1930s, and it's it's an interesting labor history story that hasn't been told. And I think when papers become available, that part of the story will become better known. Well, over time, the Williams Furniture Company was sold to several national yeah. corporations. And in 1983, the furniture company closed, at least temporarily, putting a thousand people out of work. So it, had, it you know, it, it had grown in terms of a number of employees. And then it struggled back a little bit. It was bought by several other mm -hmm. uh yeah, it was sold the first time in 1967, and it was sold to Georgia Pacific, mm -hmm. and it was sold not for the furniture company, but rather for all the timberlands. Um, but they, they kept it in operation for a while, and then it became V.B. Williams, and it struggled along and finally went out, out in, I think, 2004. And it's interesting because um, the author, Beth Macy, has written a very nice book called Factory Man, which is about... Uh, one of the furniture men out of North Carolina who eventually came to own Williams Furniture when it became V.B. Williams Company. It's it's really quite a terrific read. She's a good investigative journalist, and she has written a very good book in Factory Man. So I do recommend that to anybody who wants to understand. And part of it, a lot of it had to do with NAFTA coming in and um, competition from Chinese um furniture manufacturing and, as you said earlier, Walter Press Board, furniture replacing hardwoods and all of those things conspired, I think, to put Williams out. And I think also environmental issues because the creation of the furniture um, along Turkey Creek and in other places in Sumter and beyond, um, early on there was not very much environmental concern. And so the lacquers, the paints, all of the finishes ended up in groundwater and it creates a problem. Yeah. I want to think about the long-term impact of this idea. Let's get an economic development council together and let's start looking for something to replace cotton. Is it safe to say for a long time that this was sort of a renaissance for Sumter, having this sort of industry come in at that time when things were dire? Oh, I think so. Yeah. I think so. I think it made a huge difference in the economy and 
the mindset of the place. Well, and and what Jessica was talking about, there were veneer mills in all in, in small towns in South Carolina. In fact, there was a very large one just down the road in Swamp Street. W. B. Rast and Sons made peach baskets, bean baskets, and they literally shipped their baskets across the country. They went out of business in 1965 when everybody wanted cardboard instead of uh, the recyclable baskets. But that was something that small towns could do. And so Sumter kind of led the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because um, one of the things to sort of go for full circle, when the Santee River Cypress Lumber Company existed in Ferguson, it sold a number of different things, but they made custom shooks, S-H-O-O-K-S. So those were, um, before there was cardboard, those were the custom made wooden boxes that things were shipped in. And uh, at some point, shooks fell out of favor because cardboard came up. And then when you look at Brooklyn Cooperage, which was was running uh, the world's largest cooperage operation for um, staves and headings, the tops and the sides of barrels out of Sumter for about two decades from about 1927 to 47, fashion changed there too. And uh, people didn't really want to go to the grocery store and buy sugar out of um, a giant barrel. They wanted five pound paper sacks. And that in part put Brooklyn Cooperage out. They sold to Esdorn Corporation in 1947, but they stopped all their operations out of Sumter just about then because of changing packaging. Um, And I think the the, the technology and changing packaging story is a really important one, not one that we focus very much on yet, yet, but I think we probably want to tell that story at some point too. All right. Well, Jessica Elfenbein, I want to thank you for being with us today for our conversation. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed today's journal, and I know that I did. In the 21st century in South Carolina and across the South, incentives for businesses to come into a community, people always act like it's brand new. Well, A community back in the 1920s decided that incentives would be useful to try to turn the local economy around when they attracted a furniture manufacturer to Sumter, South Carolina. And those incentives in land and other breaks made a difference in the local economy. And it had an influence way beyond the bounds of Sumter County. That's an interesting aspect of the Palmetto State History. Walter Edgar's Journal is a production of South Carolina Public Radio. I'm Alfred Turner and I produce the show, which is made possible by listener contributions to the ETV Endowment of South Carolina. As always, we want to remind you that the views and opinions expressed on Walter Edgar's Journal are not necessarily those of South Carolina Public Radio or its underwriters. New episodes of Walter Edgar's Journal are published on the first and third Fridays of the month and are available at southcarolinapublicradio.org, as well as on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. Hey, we'll talk again soon.